Hi there, it's so good to see that you're back again for more of God's Word and worship. If it's your first time here, don't be afraid to press that share button. We hope that you're ready to worship God with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of worship. We thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. The God of the universe is listening to us as we worship Him. We praise you and we worship you for an opportunity like this. In Jesus' name, Amen. Faithfulness, oh, I will rest 
in your promises my confidence in your faithfulness oh, I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness so we say yes to your promises my your faithfulness so we say yeah to your promises our confidence is your faithfulness faithful you are faithful Our yes and amen And all your promises Our yes and amen Oh, we say yes To your promises How confidence Is your faithfulness oh, We say yes To your promises our confidence is your faithfulness cause faithful you Our yes and amen It's all your promises Our yes and amen Yes Lord we know that you are faithful you are, We know that you are faithful to your word And to your promises And that there's never been a moment it's never been a moment that we've had to dwell without you. We say thank you, Lord, that you are the good shepherd, that you are with us. Let's sing, not for a moment. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Oh, come, Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Oh, not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Yes, come, Holy Spirit. Dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Cause not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Oh, come, Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. Yes, you are. The Lord is in this place. Oh, not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place, oh come Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place, the Lord is in this place, the 
Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place.
I hear the chains hit the ground Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out Come awaken your people, come awaken the city Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out Every stronghold will crumble I hear the chains hit the ground Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out The darkest nights, you can light it up Oh, you can light it up, oh God of revival. Let hope arise, cause death is overcome. You've already won, oh God of revival. Come awaken, come awaken your people. The chains hit the ground Oh God of revival Pour it out Pour it out It's the darkest night You can light it up Oh you can light it up Yes God of revival Let hope arise Cause death is overcome You've already won Oh God of revival So we want to thank you Lord that you are a miracle working God A God who is able to do and to do again your arms have not grown shorter since your last miracle. You have not lost authority over this world. You have not lost the ability to open blind eyes. You have not lost the ability to heal the sick. You are the God of the impossible. And we want to praise you, Lord, that every single promise you've made is yes and amen. And you are faithful to what you've said. And we can rest under the shadow of your wings because we know we serve a God of the impossible. Lord, won't you come and stir it up in our hearts? Won't you come and invigorate us for your name? Won't you come and fan into flame something that might have grown cold over the last few months? but a passion for you and for your kingdom in our homes, in our towns, in our cities, in our regions, in our country, come and fan into flame a passion for Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you can transcend technology, that you can minister in our homes as you are doing right now. And I know, Lord, your Holy Spirit is moving right now. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father.
Hi there. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're joining us today. I'm trusting you're having a great time in God's presence. And I really just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your support over the last couple of months, for, for tuning in week after week, for faithfully praying for us as a church, and, and for tithing, giving to God's house so that there might always be food in the storehouse. And I really appreciate that because even during this difficult time, you have enabled this church to be a blessing. You know, that we are, even in times of... of struggle we could be a blessing and that is because of your faithfulness to God and to his church so I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart we're going to continue in this series facing the valley that we've been in now for several weeks um, and it's based on well, well largely taking from the scripture from James 1 verse 2 to 4 let me read it um, and we'll take it from there it says dear brothers and sisters when troubles of any kind come your way consider it an opportunity for great joy for you know That when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now I've said this a bunch and I'm going to say it again. An opportunity is a set of circumstances that has made something possible that was impossible before. So when troubles and trials come your way, it is making something possible that has never been possible in your life before. So there's something we need to grow, we need to learn, we need to know. There's something we need to develop in trial times so that we might become perfect and complete, not needing anything. I mean, don't we all want to be there? Isn't that the mission? I mean, how good does that sound? So we want to take steps towards that. And that is why we're doing this series called Facing the Valley, because we want to do this. We want to take this opportunity for everything that it is and grow in this season. So last week, we I shared on uh, Psalm 23 and, and specifically the first four verses of Psalm 23. And it was really incredible. We looked at, you know, God being our shepherd, you know, and what that means. What is it that God is our shepherd? If you missed that or any of the series so far, do go check it out. It's on YouTube. It's still going to be available. Um, so do go check it out. I don't want you to miss out. There's been some good stuff. Um, but anyway, so, so we looked at the first part of Psalm 23. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. I, I don't lack anything. So, so check that out. Um, and we're continuing with this today. But, but one of the significant things for me in last week was the fact that him being with us helps us go through the valley. So, so keep moving through the valley. That is the secret to this. And I use the analogy of the trust fall where no one's afraid to fall if they trust the person who they're falling into, if they trust the one that's with them. And that is the shepherd. The shepherd keeps us strong, keeps us going in the valley. So that was week one of Psalm 23. I know there's a lot more to Psalm 23, but we're just going to spend two weeks on it. So I'm limited in what I can share on it. Um, let me read the whole Psalm 23 again, and then we're just going to spend a bit of time looking at verses five and six. So it's Psalm 23, um, a Psalm of David, and it reads, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So last week we went up to verse 4 in this beautiful verse that says, you know, that him being with us gives us the ability, helps us to stand and keep going through this dark valley or the valley of the shadow of death as we know it. Um, And right after this verse, talking about his presence that enables us, comes some of the most amazing verses, you know, because David says here, in the presence of, the, of my enemies, you prepare a table for me. In the presence of my enemies, you make a space for me. And we'll get back to the table in just a minute. I just want to skip past and we'll get back to it in a moment. Because he goes on to say that God anoints his, 
head with oil. So God anoints him with oil and his cup overflows, cup overflowing more than he needs. But but this anointing is so interesting because I believe that you are anointed. Come on, say it. I am anointed. Now say it to someone next to you. I am anointed. I believe that we are all anointed. And this anointing is so interesting because there are, are you know, both practical and spiritual implications to what David is saying. So, so there's the practical implication that in ancient Jewish customs, you know, what they did and, and still practiced in, in the Near East, um, in some places, is the guest of honor, when they come, you anoint them with oil. So you literally pour oil on their heads. Now, now before you go out and pour canola or sunflower oil or, or any oil on, on any of your guests, let me just explain why. Because what was happening is, is because of, it was a means of refreshing. It was a means of, of invigorating once again because here's the they, they're in the desert you know it is hot up there it is dusty and especially the dust um it's like a lime dust in palestine um and it would have dried out their skin and it would have been quite uncomfortable so so they would actually uh, anoint themselves rub on them oil in all the exposed areas like their face or their head their hands um, because it would actually refresh them so so this is what they did for their honored guests when the guests comes what they do is they actually refresh them with the oil they make them comfortable they they try and and really lavish on them comfort, refreshing, invigorating. And this is incredible because this is what David is saying. You know, you honor me at your table and you refresh me with your oil. That's amazing. That's just incredible how God invites us into this place. Before I even get to the spiritual part of the anointing here, maybe you've missed that. The refreshing of God. Because some of us are still sitting at the table with that lime dust covering us and we're itchy and scratchy because it's dry. And God's saying, hey, why don't you take my anointing, my refreshing? Anyway, so let's get to the spiritual part here. Because anointing also speaks of being set apart, you know, being ordained for something special. There is purpose. There is uh, ordination for, for usage by God. Like all the things of the tabernacle and the temple, God anointed with oil to set them apart for usage before God. And David had the same experience. So, so we're reading from 1 Samuel 16. In the beginning of 1 Samuel 16, I'm going to read verse 1, and then we're going to skip ahead to verse 12 and 13. Uh, verse 1 says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I rejected him as king over Israel? He's asking, Hey, how long are you going to hold on to that which is past? Uh, he says, Fill your ho- horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be the king. Obviously, God is talking about David. So so God is sending Samuel to David, not knowing who it was, um, but sending Samuel to David because God has already chosen David. He's already set him apart for his ministry. And that ministry specifically was to be king. So so skipping down to verse 12, this is after Samuel saw all the other brothers. So so he looked at the brothers and, and... just didn't feel it was the one, and, and one after the other came past, and he just said, no, no, these aren't the ones. And he asked him, hey, do you have any other sons? Um, and Jesse, David's dad, said, yeah, I've got one more son, the youngest, he's out in the field, which was highly unlikely, okay, because the firstborn got the right, okay? This is how it works in royalty. If you're firstborn, you're the first heir to the throne. David wasn't the firstborn, but we won't go about that today. Um, so reading from verse 12, It says, so he sent for him, this is sent for David, Jesse sent for David, and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and, uh, sorry, and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So so here's the the spiritual side of the anointing is is you've been set apart. You've been set apart and empowered for service. Look at that. It says this is the one I chose. This is the one that's set apart. And then it says from that day, from the point of anointing, the spirit of God came powerfully upon David. So with the anointing, with the setting apart, with the mission comes the power. 
That's so important. We're going to get, get back to that. But uh, um, David was set apart and empowered for service. And, and then listen to what Paul writes uh, in, in, to the Christians in Corinth. And this is where we're getting at. This is being empowered for the ministry. It starts off by saying, sorry, we're reading from 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20 to 22. And it says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Can I read that again? That is so important. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through Him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. All of His promises are yes and Amen. Verse 21, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set His seal of ownership on us, and put His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. We've been set apart. We've been you know, put apart for His service. We have the seal of ownership on us and we have been, listen to that, it is God who enables us, who makes us stand firm in Christ Jesus. This is what the anointing does. This is so incredible because I think we sometimes forget that we have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. I think there's a danger to thinking that some are or some Christians are anointed and others aren't. See, see, we've been set apart for different purposes, but we've all been anointed by the Holy Spirit if you've received Him. We've all received this gift, this empowerment, this setting apart, this ability to stand in Jesus Christ as you stand firm. And this is what I'm getting at. But don't you think it is so interesting that in the psalm, David affirms his anointing while he's in the presence of his enemies. This is when the anointing is reaffirmed. This is when David says, listen, even though I'm in the presence of my enemies and there's a table set before me, I must remind myself that I've been anointed. I have been set apart. I have been enabled. I can stand through Christ Jesus. Let's get to the table. I want to get to the table. Because here in in verse, let me not get it wrong, verse 5, David writes and he says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I I think we need to understand from the get-go, this is a table for two. For two. This is a table that that God has prepared for you. The the shepherd prepared a space just for you and him. That that is what he's doing. He's saying, hey, I have the bounty. This is the desert, but what I'm doing, I'm preparing a feast and I'm laying a table before you, even in the presence of your enemies. I'm not a God of the, the as few as possible. I'm the God of blessing. I'm preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And in in, in ancient times, by the way, feasts that were were often held after a covenant was made. So after people agreed on something, after a promise was made, they would eat together, they would feast together just to celebrate this new bond, this friendship that they have, uh, you know, really bonded over in this covenant. And here, just after the promise is made that the shepherd is going to be with us, you know, that we are with God in the dark times in our lives, that that there's never going to be a time where we cannot get through, and and that being with him, being anointed by the Holy Spirit, as we just read in 2 Corinthians, is what enables us to stand through even difficult times because we can stand in Christ. God enables us to do so. And in this space, in this difficulty, God says, well, I don't just want you to stand. I want you to come and feast with me. There's a beauty in here because, listen, I know that you're surrounded by by trouble circumstances. I know that you're facing pressure and job loss and financial issues, relational turmoil. I know that we are facing divorce. I know that we are facing family structures that's been ripped apart. I know that we are facing calamities. I know that we're facing illness. We're facing disease. We're facing cancer. We're facing COVID. We're facing doubt. We're facing addiction. We're facing hopelessness. We're facing uncertainty. The enemies are surrounding us. 
Uh, but see, here's the thing. Here's the thing which we, we fall into sometimes is what we're doing is we're going to focus on these enemies rather than realizing that there's been a table set for us, just us and the king, and he's saying, come sit down. Come sit down. I, I know you're surrounded. I know doubt is knocking on your door. I, I know fear is just around the corner. I know we see these enemies all around us come and sit and rest. Let me anoint your head with oil. Let me refresh you. Come and sit. Be refreshed. Enjoy my presence. So even in the, in the midst of our enemies, what God wants is to strengthen our relationship with Him. That's really something I've been missing in this lockdown time, is being able to, to just have the option, really, of, of going out and, and having a meal with my wife. And, because there's, there's something intimate about sitting together, a table for two, a table for two. God is inviting you to a table for two. Yeah, I know the enemies are all around us. I know that that is still happening. And God is saying, even though this is happening in your life, even though you're facing these valleys, I still want you. But as I was thinking about this table, I started wondering, God intended this table for, for two. God intended it to be you know, us and Him. Not us all, like individually, us and him. God wants to spend that table. But I've realized that so many of us has made it a table for three or four or five or six. You know, so many of us have our enemies standing by. And rather than focusing on God, the shepherd who has set the table, we pull out a chair for them to join us. We're sitting at this table, but we're inviting fear to come and join us. We're, we're inviting addiction to come and sit by us. We're inviting uncertainty. We're inviting depression. We're inviting things into this precious space with God that never should have been there. And then we can't understand why, why we're not feeling refreshed. We can't understand why it is we're struggling so much, why we're struggling to make sense of these things. But instead of having a space just for you and God, you have a space for you and depression, for you and addiction, for you and, and fear, for you and whatever your enemy is. That's why we're struggling to face the valley. Because we've taken away that space. Because what was intended to be a blessing We've turned into a curse. The space that God has made was, was intended to refresh us, to rejuvenate us, but we've tainted it. And I think it's time to, even if we want to do so politely, but, but to invite our enemies to leave. Take back your table with God. Take back your times of refreshing with God. Don't allow the enemy to come into your space with God. I'm not just talking about quiet times. I'm talking about how you're thinking, how you're approaching your day, how you're actually going about your ins and outs of every day. Are you spending time with enemies rather than with God? Because listen, the devil will invite himself to your table. He will. He'll come and sit down in the middle of it. And you need to be vigilant in, in protecting your space with God. Protecting that intimacy with Him. And that's what some of you need today. Some of, some of you need today is to ask Him to excuse Himself because you know, you're realizing that you've invited fear to join the table. You've invited these things in. And, and rather than when enemies come up, when these things come up, when, when you see this on social media or on the news, rather than retreating to intimacy with God, you retreat to fear. 
when these news articles or whatever start coming your way, when your when your boss says another bad word or your colleague rubs you, rubs you up the wrong way, when your kids drive you up the wall, when your parents don't want to listen to you, when your studies are too much, rather than running to intimacy with God in the midst of your enemies, what you're doing is you're running to division, to a addiction to aggression you're running to fear and depression and i think it's time we start running to the right place run to the table that is set in the presence of your enemies and your thoughts and your action run to a table with god see because what's happening is we are selling our fear i'm oh, sorry selling our peace What's happening is we are ridding ourselves of joy. Because we're not running to the place where we can find it. Now I want to talk straight to you today. Is that okay? You're struggling. You have a lack of joy. You have a lack of peace. Because you've been looking for it in the wrong place. Guess what? Scrolling down Facebook is not going to give you the peace you seek. It's not. Getting people to agree with your viewpoints, with your stance on things, is not going to give you the satisfaction you desire. It's not going to refresh you. But there is a table set for you in the presence of your enemies. A table where God promises, hey, this is the place where I can pour out my anointing over you, where you can be refreshed, where you can get, be empowered by the Holy Spirit to keep standing, to keep going through this dark valley. And then David says in verse 6, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So here he's contrasting, you know, being pursued by enemies, by being pursued by the love and goodness of God. Because when enemies are all around us, when when there's war, the enemy wants to get at you. And, and believe it or not, we are in a war and the enemy wants to get at you. You are being pursued. And here David says, but wait a minute, I'm being pursued by the love and the goodness of God. And this will never end. I'm being pursued by him. And this is the benefit we enjoy as followers of Christ. We are pursued by His goodness and love. This is a benefit that we have. And then David turns it around and he says, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He says, This is what I'm going to pursue, to be wherever you are. You've invited me in, now I'm committing to it. I'm going to commit myself to wherever your presence is. I am going to dwell where you are. I'm wondering, are you dwelling where God is? Are you taking every thought captive and pushing it in towards to the direction where God is? Are you actually pursuing His presence? Or are you pursuing your rights? I'm shooting straight today. Because I feel like what happens in these valleys that we're facing, in these storms, in these trials, is we're becoming us-focused. We're becoming selfish. And under normal circumstances, maybe that would be a slightly appropriate response to great trauma. But at the moment, what's happening is we are becoming so selfish that we are starting to block ourselves off from the very presence of God because we are saying, poor me, no one's going through what I'm going through. But the reality is that the goodness of God is following us. And I want to know, are we going to follow his presence? Are you going to run after him? I think there's a commitment that needs to be made. His goodness and His love is following us all the days of our lives. Are we going to commit to staying where He is? Are are we going to control ourselves enough? Are we going to take captive every thought and force it into submission to God? Are we going to come to the table that's been set for us? You might be wondering, Hein, how does this all relate, you know? How does this all relate to the valley? Well, I've said it a bunch of times. There's this amazing promise 
God is saying, even in the midst of your enemies, even while you're facing these things, even in the dark valleys of life, I am there. I'm with you. I've prepared a safe space for you. I will anoint your head with oil. I'll remind you of the anointing that you already carry. Will you come to my presence? I believe that the valley that we're in at the moment is a valley of deepening relationship with God. See, you see, God is not trying to get us to figure out how to get out of this valley at the moment. I truly believe God wants us to go to Him. God wants us to go to the table and that space with God is where you find safety. It's where you find peace. It's where you find hope. So let's be real. Let's be real. Do you lack peace? Do you lack joy? Do you lack hope? Have you invited rebellion? Have you invited racism? Have you invited division to sit at your table? I want to challenge us today. There's a table set for you, a table for two. The king is waiting. He's waiting there for you. Won't you leave behind the enemies and go to the table that he has set for you? Lord, I thank you that today we just get to spend a couple of moments looking at your word, looking at your promises. And this morning, Lord, I know that you are calling us You're calling us back to the table, back to a place of refreshing, a place of joy, a place of peace. Lord, I want to pray for every person that has been unsettled in their spirits. Lord, I pray for every person that has had hopelessness and and depression and anxiety at their tables. Lord, would you give us the strength to pursue your presence as your love and goodness pursues us. Help us, Lord, to understand when the enemy is attacking us and trying to get us away from what you intended for us. Trying to steal away from our hope, our peace, our joy. Thank you, Lord, that you are waiting with open arms. And that your promise is that Your Spirit enables us to endure. That we have been anointed, we've been set apart. We have been empowered, even for a season like this. Remind us of your anointing. Remind us of your refreshing. Remind us of your hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining. See you again next week. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Hein, for such a wonderful message. If you haven't yet, go and watch part one. That was the message that was preached last week. Share, like, and subscribe. We hope to see you again next week.